Good morning. Um, Santosh, you can start your presentation. Good morning, sir. Is my slide visible, sir? I'm audible, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. So we are. So one minute. I'm not able to hear you, Santosh. Sir, uh, no, sir, you can hear me. Yeah, if the queue is there, sir. Any issues with your internet? Uh, your voice is uh, disturbed. So now you can hear me, sir, clearly? Yes, yes. Today, we are going to talk about the management of recurrent shoulder posterior shoulder instability. So coming to interaction, so mainly the treatment of posterior shoulder instability always includes physical therapy protocol, which consists of strengthening of the external rotators and pericapsular muscles and can be aided with electrical stimulation to re-educate the muscle during the shoulder and arm motion. Uh, when coming to conservative treatment fails, surgical repair of capsule labor lesion with a soft tissue reconstruction technique results in good clinical outcomes and when there is minimal or no bone defect present. Even in high-risk population like military, contact sports and athletes, without bony lesion or minimal bony lesion uh, defect, the reconstruction with soft tissue uh, procedure will be helpful. In contrast, in contrast, in case of traumatic erosion or dysplastic post glenoid defect, the repair of eye incidence failure and bone grafting reconstruction or open as a arthroscopic is the proposed management. Sir, Santosh, we can't we can't see your presentation. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Now we can see. Okay, sir. So lesion associated with posterior dislocation or first we do two things: the bony defect, one either in humeral or in glenoid. If it's in numeral, it will be a reverse ILSAC lesion. Whereas in glenoid, it's an increase either retroversion or glenoid hypoplasia or posterior glenoid bone loss. In this image, the A depicts the glenoid. Uh, there is a loss in the glenoid bone by, uh, in which we have to draw a best fit circle method where a, uh, D is the bone loss and measure divided by A where the bone is there uh, into 100. So depending upon this, they, we can uh, plan for either the bo soft tissue procedure or bony procedure. Then coming to the reverse ill sac, we have to measure with gamma angle. Is then measured by the line draw from the the line draw from the bicipital group uh, and measure to the center of the circle and to the medial border of the defect. Medial border of the defect. This angle, if more than ninety degree, is considered as engaging lesion. So we can we should treat with bony uh, procedures. Then third will be the measurement of glenoid uh, retroversion. In this, the axial 
in this the axial uh, cut of the CT has been taken. Using the Friedman's method, we should uh, measure the cleaner version. Then coming to soft tissue lesions like uh, posterior so bankout lesion, Kim lesions, plus uh, <coughs> postpartum Bennett lesion, and GLAD lesions. So now coming to the ABC classification, uh, first, the A is uh, said to be the first time dislocation, B is the dynamic motion of the shoulder joint, and C will be the static motion of the shoulder joint. In A, type 1 is subluxation and B, uh, A, type 2 is dislocation. Whereas B is functional dynamic posture instability, where type 2 is structural dynamic posture instability. In C is type 1 constitutional uh, static instability and type 2 is acquired uh, posture, static uh, posture instability. A and B, uh, A1 and A2 has been explained by Dr. Chetan last class. Of first time dislocation, I'm mainly concentrating about B1 and B2, C1, C2. So, uh, just for a recall, A, A is the group of patients, all patients who are included in the first time dislocation, with that either it has been a, occurred in terms of subluxation without engagement of humeral head with the posterior glenoid rim, is mentioned as A, or in terms of dislocation with temporary or persistent engagement, is A2. This distinct group. Uh, as two subtypes, a possibly combination of taking the patient history and, and imaging may be helpful in acute, even in acute and painful settings. Now, coming to B, this group, all the patients with recurrent dynamic posterior instability events that occurs during the motion, either in form of functional instability or structural instability. Uh, versus B1, functional dynamic posture instability. What will be the pathomechanics? Pathomechanics in this is pathological activation of pattern of rotator cuff muscles as well as pericapsular muscle that may lead to the posterior dislocation of humor during the movement of the arm. In this, there will no, not be any structural damages. This type of posterior glenoid instability is always associated with hyperlaxity uh, posterior capsular attendance or a flattening of glenoid concavity or increased glenoid version due to glenoid dysplasia. A main cause of this functional is atraumatic development of aberrant shoulder muscle activation pattern during adolescent age. And for this, the treatment might be a conservative with intensive uh, physiotherapy to normalize the muscle activation pattern. The physiotherapy should always be focused on the scapular motion coordination and activation of external rotators. Coming to the surgical treatment, it is not war warrant in this in this group of patients as it usually fails to restore the stability and often result in pain as well as limited function. Only if the posture instability persists despite of successful treatment and functional component might need the surgical treatment like structural deficiency, we should attempt for a salvage procedure. So coming to B2, B2 is a structural but dynamic posture instability. Uh, in this, the structural damage includes like bankard, posture bankard lesion, capsular insufficient due to repeated micro trauma, then posture glenoid bone loss or critical reverse ill stack lesion. And this might cause posture shoulder instability during axial loading like for flexion and internally rotated arm. And this type of instability can enhance the multifactorial combination of individual constitution of structural and functional deficiency, like I said, like hypercapsulaxity and glenoid cavity and shoulder dyskinesia may also give some contribution. What might be the cause for the structural dynamic push instability is the single mechanical trauma or involuntary muscle contraction due to seizures and Electrical accident as a repetitive microtrauma. Coming to clinical presentation of this patient, this patient uh, current recurrent dislocation or subluxation with flexion of internal rotation of the arm. However, they are not often recognized as instability, but they are they will they will, patient will represent as weakness or clinking sound noise by the patient. So, how will the functional test has to be do, uh, done? Like jerks test, Kim's test as well as load shift and load and shift test. So th this image shows 
the mri of the for a image shows the mri of shoulder instability with posterior bony banker in the in the first image whereas second image shows in the ct there is a, bo a bony lesion in the posterior aspect and third is the mri orthogram where you can see there is a posterior lateral damage co combined with the structural deficiency and treatment in this case a uh, patient with mainly the three things are the, to be noted one is the reverse ilsac defect and posterior bony defect and posterior capsular defect and insufficiency first two things might be you should treated with bony procedure and posterior capsular defect may be treated with arthroscopic capsular labral repair and it may give the improvement in stability and pain free and functional movement in the patient coming to group c all the patient with chronic static posterior glenoid damage should ca uh, caused by either constitutional structural deficiency or acquired structural deficiency in the constitutional posterior shoulder instability in this case the pathomechanics is not it's not poor, uh, still is poorly understood and the cause is mainly because of force imbalance and scapular mal positioning if they might the patient might uh, had excessive glenoid retroversion or in mal formation of glenoid ossification center and clinical presentation most commonly the patient will be asymptomatic in early stages when the patient develop pain that may be leads to increase in posterior cartilage damage and due to progressive eccentric wear and tear and if the now the picture depicts the uh, mri of the static constitutional posterior shoulder instability with increased humeral head translation uh, with glenoid convex shaped glenoid and increase in retroversion the second image shows a b c d a in this uh, the post axial cut of ct visualizing of presence of dysplasia in the glenoid and retroversion the first image is in normal b is the lazy j lazy j rounded glenoid deficiency and c is the triangular deltoid bony deficiency coming to the treatment of plan the conservative treatment includes physiotherapy in an atom to recenter uh, center the humor head during the early stage of pathology and it reduces the symptom presence of by advancing the degenerative changes in the first line of treatment so in these cases demanding at, uh, sports and work should be avoided and surgical treatment like anterior soft tissue release combined with posterior capsular rafe and if it's in the glenoid deficiency uh, we should go for a open wedge glenoid osteotomy and if there is a glenoid glenoid defect we should go for a bone block procedures then C2 is the acquired static posterior shoulder instability. This is acquired mainly after structural damage includes large river, reverse ilsac lesion either in the humeral head or a posterior glenoid bone defect in the glenoid. This may lead to the decentralize the mean humeral head remains in the posteriorly subluxated or dislocated position. And in children with brachial plexus injury in the birth palsy, they ensure the internal rotation contracture along with rotational force couple imbalance can lead to static post humeral suplex and causes severe osseous development deficiency including the posterior glenoid rim dysplasia the causes of acquired static instability may be seizures and electrical accidents and the presentation will be pain and limited motion especially concerned to the external rotators and the those patient ex, ex, excessive posterior humeral head translation the shoulder contour is changed in some patient featuring of prominent coracoid tip and in these cases the chronic shoulder gets locked and the chronic uh, locked dislocation external rotation is often severely reduced and even blocked while internal rotated and elevation are sometimes preserved at certain cases and this in this image you can see the humeral gets locked in the glenoid for chronic cases the a image shows the 
posterior large reverse ill sacs and second is untreated posterior glenoid dream impaction with decentered humeral head that progress to the degenerative changes for this acquired static we should go for a open reduction and restoration of the articular cartilage combined with a soft tissue balancing in case of chronic locked severe ill sac lesion we should go either bone grafting represent the joint preservation jo treatment of choice but rotational osteotomy remains the secondary uh, option in advanced cases if the osteoarthritis is present and the patient as uh, patient age is also advanced we should go for a anatomical uh, arthroplasty it should be performed in case the soft tissue balance is not achieved in long term process reverse shoulder arthroplasty may be helpful and it will give a good functional outcome in case of posterior bone defect uh, joint procedure should include posterior bone block procedure and posterior open wedge osteotomy and according to kim and uh, and his colleague they classified isolated labral lesion to four types type 1 is incomplete detached type 2 is marginal crack Uh, crack also associated with kim lesions in this the treatment consists of you should mainly focus on detachment freshening and repairing of the labrum on the surface of the glenoid third will be the condral labral uh, erosion in this it should treated as as a type 1 and type 4 will be the degenerative tear of the labrum and we are coming to all soft tissue procedure we are, now we are going to discuss first is the capsular shift during the capsular shift procedure the surgeon tightens and reposition the shoulder joint with a fibrous structure that surrounds and stabilizes the shoulder joint by manipulating the capsule the sur surgeon aims in restoring the stability to of the shoulder joint and reduce the dislocation first time the capsular shift was done by neer and Fro froster in 1980 this procedure aims in reducing the capsular and ligamentous redundance when bank card repair was previously failed the th in this image the drawing shows that the posterior capsular shift the dashed line is the line represent the initial insertion to the deltoid uh the insertion limited to access the 5 cm and prevents the damage of underlying axillary nerve the arrow mark is demonstrating the so the shift of the posterior inferior flap of the capsule in order to remove the inferior pouch and reinforce the repair a uh, study done by uh, study done in 1995 they represent the superior shift of the post inferior aspect of the capsule specifically of the posterior glenoid subluxation and dislocation they found that out of 28 out of 34 patient 28 patient have experienced a good and excellent outcome of surgical procedure coming to thermal capsular rafe in early 90s thermal ca capsular rafe has been to the uh, it, it's a video we are playing see there is a uh, this helps in shrinking rather than suturing together with elongated glenoid rim the the this yellow the part which show is shrunken where is that the red is not shrunken once we eat the cal capsule labrum at a heat of 65 degree the disrupted collagen cross links and then interferes with the triple helix structure to form a collagen polypeptide chain initially they used olivium plus yog laser but it didn't get it has given a good outcome initially at 6 months follow up but further long term follow up tends to be failed coming to labrum repair labrum lipper of the bony uh, is a bank or posterior reverse bank or uh, bank or lesion by it leads to repairing the posterior labrum inferiorly and it helps in prevent the subluxation of the shoulder joint so for the first image you can see the there is a tear in the posterior glenoid labrum through the anti uh, standard portal labrum is uh, arthroscopically we identify the labrum and the capsule along with the posterior labrum is taken and it is uh, uh, sutured 
along the glenoid cavity with the to prevent this further uh, dislocation of the shoulder joint. In this fixation of the suture anchor with the labrum in the glenoid cavity is seen. A study done on arthroscopic posterior labral repair and capsular shift by traumatic unidirectional recurrent shoulder instability by Kim et al. They said that in 27 cases of traumatic unidirectional, unidirectional recurrent shoulder instability uh, subluxation and perform the capsular shift, there is the treat, uh, there is no chance of recurrence after the uh, arthroscopic labral without any bony procedure. And Botany et al. performed arthroscopic stabilization of posterior shoulder with bio-observed screw on 19 patients and open repair on 14 patients with traumatic posterior shoulder instability. And he reported that the patient who received arthroscopic stabilization with bio bioobservable suture anchors are significantly better in the row score than the patient with open procedure. So, sum up of the soft tissue procedures, uh, reverse bank out repair often represents the combination of arthroscopic capsular plication and posterior inferior capsular shift. And arthroscopic capsular plication includes patient with isolated unidirectional posterior instability without true labral repair. And open posterior inferior capsular shift is a surgical option for the patient with posterior inferior subluxation with no anterior component uh, function, uh, uh, under functional int intact rotator interval. And co coming to reverse putty pad, no often reduced in this nowadays because of the reduced range of movements. And thermal capsulography is not recommended because of high recurrence rate. Coming to osseous procedure, uh, the bony procedure, reverse ILSAC, the large ILSAC, reverse ILSAC, McLaughlin procedure was performed. In this procedure, the subscapularis tendon is transformed from the lesser tuberosity of the muscle to the bony defect. This procedure was then modified as a uh, where subscapularis muscle along with the lesser tuberosity has been inserted into the defect. And it is a, uh, this procedure has become more popular and, uh, and it prevents the further shoulder instability. The current treatment of choice for uh, engaging humeral lesion with gamma angle more than 90 degree in a reverse rimply search using subscapularis tendon. Other techniques of treatment of reverse slacks are Block et al. describes disimpaction with elongation and bone, uh, bone grafting. Dick et al. Uh, Dick et al. Uh, is, uh, represent reconstruction with osteochondral holograph. Coming to glean or hypoplasia, in this, uh, usually it's bilateral and symmetrical findings. And the posterior glenoid rim deficiency, we should focus for local hypoplasia of the posterior glenoid. And radiologically, we can find that uh, rounded J shape or triangle delta form. For this posterior bone block procedure has been described for the patient with posterior glenoid rim deficiency. And coming to reverse bony bank out lesion, the fracture in the posterior inferior glenoid limb. In this case, posterior bone block will be using either iliac crust graft, autograft, or bone graft from the acromion process. And uh, survey at all recommended an overhang approximately of 5 to 10 mm for the posterior aspect of the glenoid. And in case, uh, and uh, Barbier et al. described posterior enlargement of glenoid cavity rather than blocking effect. And the, the diagram represents the blo uh, bone block procedure with ac acromium or iliac crust bone graft. In this procedure, they have increased the surface area of the glenoid, so, uh, glenoid and improves the stability of the patient. Coming to glenoid retroversion, the glenoid retroversion uh, normal range is from 0 to 7 degree and uh, Friedman technique we use to measure the glenoid version and if the posterior glenoid deficiency plus retroversion is more than 10 degree, we, sh uh, we should go for a bony block, uh, we should go for a glenoid osteotomy procedure. A study done for the posterior glenoid, uh, posterior shoulder instability with the glenoid retroversion and they said that glenoid retroversion when we improve, uh, when we change with the glenoid osteotomy has significantly increased the patient with posterior instability compared with those with anterior instability. This image depicts the glenoid version has been improved in the posterior aspect with a, taking a wedge from the posterior glenoid and the version has been increased. 
and a study done by Shabas Esmolik, and they tell that totally in a nine in a one zero pay uh, one not nine patients was done. The success rate of glenar osteotomy was seventy eight percent, and the complication high risk of formula is eighteen eighteen point three percent. And some arthroscopic bony block procedures uh, indication is the posterior erosion glenar loss of more than ten percent of the best fit circle, and abnormal retroversion of ten to twenty five degree, and posterior dim dysplasia uh, is the J sign or delta. Glenar shape and failure of previous soft tissue procedure, and mainly the we should note that functional unidirectional uh, demonstrate non voluntary instability should be taken consideration, and contraindication or voluntary posture instability, multi-directional instability, and static posture subluxation. Some sum up of the osseous bone uh, bony procedure, so posterior bone block or posterior wedge osteotomy should be indicated in. Failed capsular placation, glenar hypoplasia, and increase in retroversion or osteochondral frac fracture of the glenoid cavity with posterior bone, uh, glenoid bone loss. And McLagan procedure or modified by knee modification procedure should be done in re uh, large reverse ILSAC defect of 25 to 35 percent of humeral defect. If the if there is more, uh, we can go for alternative humeral allograft. And posterior labro capsular periosteal sleeve avulsion. In this, the sleeve a strip of glenoid uh, pro, uh, this strip of glenoid has been avulsed from its position. So in this case, we have to freshen the posterior glenoid edge and subsequently posterior labrum fixation with 5 mm of suture anchor should be done. Now Bennett lesion, extra articular curvilinear capsular uh, calcification of the posterior infraglenoid near to the attachment of the posterior uh, posterior band of IGHL. And in this case, you should do for a arthroscopic removal of symptomatic ben uh, Bennett. Uh, Veringetol said that it should be suspected when evaluating the throwers with posterior shoulder pain. Uh, the last is the, the latest study or compressive management of posterior shoulder instability. They give a flow chart. Uh, first, symptomatic recurrent posterior inst uh, shoulder instability, Stuc either structure or function, we should first treat with physical therapy. If symptoms persist, you should go. You should either try multidirectional posterior predominance or unidirectional. If it's unidirectional, you think you should think about voluntary interventional or there must be non-voluntary. If it's voluntary, all don't go for surgery. Always go physical treatment, uh, physical therapy. Then if it's demonstrative, uh, non-voluntary, you you should know, uh, always know about the glenoid defect, retroversion or posterior rim uh, dysplasia. If all those things, we should go plan for posterior bone block or plus arthroscopic capsule labrador repair. When coming to multidirectional post instability, if the glenoid defect is less than 10 percentage and gamma angle is less than 90 degree, go only for labral repair on arthroscopic pl plication. If the gamma in glenoid defect less than 10, but gamma angle is more than 90, you should plan for labral repair plus reverse arthroscopic remplissage. If these two procedures fails, then, then go for posterior bone block and arthroscopic capsular labral repair. Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, Santosh. That's actually a very extensive uh, talk. Uh, it's not possible to explain all the aspects in one uh, talk, but you managed to do it. Thanks a lot. Uh, the last uh, slide, the flow chart which you showed is the key, key one. Because... Um, uh, we don't see uh, plenty of posterior shoulder instability in our practice, but we have to have a high index of suspicion, especially as, you, as I used to tell before, in a young patient who complains of pain while throwing. We always uh, think about anterior shoulder instability, but uh, we don't give a high index of suspicion to the posterior. That's because uh, anterior shoulder instability is very common because of the nature of work and the nature of rotation of the humerus during day-to-day -day work Danny, uh, as uh, external rotation uh, baby, uh, causes that. Come. Uh, sir, Vidya Sagar, sir, uh, can you kindly mute your mic, sir? Oh, sorry, sir. Yeah. Now, uh, what happens is with the uh, external rotation in the arm, uh, the uh, shoulder is more prone, prone for anterior inferior dislocation. But uh, the most uh, problematic pathomechanics in uh, throwers shoulder is excessive posterior translation that happens during the uh, late cocking phase. 
which becomes a repetitive injury and leads on to a posterior labral tear or some anatomical lesion. And that is the one which comes to your, uh, that those are the patients who come to your clinic uh, saying that they have a vague pain or a shoulder discomfort, which is associated with activity, throwing activity. And classically, these patients have a posterior superior or posterior joint line tenderness. And sometimes they will have the Kim's uh, test positive. So you, you should be extremely careful when you're coming across this population because it's very easy for us to miss. And unless and until we intimate the radiologist about this clinical finding, they may not be able to pick up the lesion posteriorly. You know, thank God we have uh, the expertise of clarity over here, but uh, not all radiologists are like clarity. We have to intimate them. So uh, as a as an orthopedic surgeon, you have to have a high index of suspicion in um, picking up this history and this clinical symptom and then indicating that to the radiologist. Now, as uh, Santosh has uh, clearly mentioned, any non-structural deformity just needs physiotherapy. And here, the role of physiotherapist plays a very important uh, effect. They have to think about stabilizing the scapula at the same time, stretching the posterior um, uh, um, capsular tissues, improving the GERD, which is commonly seen in overhead athletes, as well as reconditioning the rotator cuff muscles, ensuring that the concavity compression is restored. This is in the presence of a normal bony anatomy. If there is increased scapular uh, glenoid retroversion, which is more than 10 degrees, or the presence of glenoid dysplasia, then uh, in such cases, conservative treatment may not su succeed. And hence, uh, there may be a need for an open surgical procedures in the form of opening bone block in case of uh, glenoid deficiency or uh, open wedge osteotomy posterior to the glenoid in case if the um, retroversion is more than 10 degrees. Uh, the hill sac lesion, reverse hill sac lesion plays a role, but um, we don't frequently see the more than 90 degree gamma angle, but that's a very effective way to quantify the hill sac, uh, reverse hill sac lesion. If we see any patients with a posterior labral tear along with increased gamma angle of 90 degrees and above, yes, definitely the McLaurin procedure is uh, better and it does not have any contraindications or, or complications. Because that itself is, uh, we, are, we are trying to uh, do something similar to how we stretch the intraspinatus. And eventually, over a period of time, the subscapularis stretches out. Yeah. But mm. um, because of the positioning, the arm positioning and day-to-day -day activities, uh, most of the uh, 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 McLaurin procedures will not cause any um, uh, structural um, uh, disability to the patients. And hence, it is, uh, as far as uh, the current literature is concerned, it is definitely successful in uh, preventing the engagement of the reverse hill sac onto the posterior glenoid rim. So keep in mind, any structural defect definitely needs fixation in the form of Bankart repair uh, with uh, reverse uh, remplissage or the McLaurin, or we have to do a posterior bone block procedure, or we have to do an open witch osteotomy. Any non-structural or repetitive uh, in the form of muscle dysfunction or scapular dyskinesis, primary goal of treatment is um, scapular uh, strengthening exercises, cuff uh, conditioning exercises, and posterior capsular stretching exercises. The history is uh, 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 thermal capsulography. It is history. Uh, it is a, a complete failure. Uh, I think Sir has uh, seen uh, many people failing in that uh, procedure. Uh, better not to burn any normal tissues. And uh, the flow chart which you showed last is uh, the right way to go about when you're addressing a patient with suspected posterior instability. Shyam, can I ask uh, if um, yes, sir. internal impingement in an athlete and all the ventilation and all that, uh, and uh, posterior subluxation, posterior labral tear, is, is, is all this a part of um, the cycle posterior Hundred uh, percent cycle. Hundred percent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is. It is because uh, it, it is the um, shoulder is taken into a supra physiological load, not a normal load. Supra physiological load, and the loading is quite uh, severe in the posterior superior aspect of the uh, glenoid, where uh, the infraspinatus and uh, uh, posterior superior glenoid rim impinge, and uh, with uh, repetitive activities, uh, there is a defect which develops which can be in the form of a partial articular-sided infraspinatus tear or a uh, rupture of 
or detachment of the posto superior labrum, which uh, later on progresses to a tear or a tear with a paralabral cyst formation. So these are all uh, uh, a vicious cycle, uh, which probably starts with uh, the activity level and the presence of a uh, posterior capsular tightness or uh, abnormal scapulohumeral rhythm, which predisposes to this pathology. Uh, but unfortunately, what happens is the patient comes to us only during the when the symptoms are present. If the symptoms are present, it means that the, the, the anatomical uh, damage has already occurred. And um, uh, uh, very difficult to prevent this. Uh, but if we have any suspicion of a uh, patient who is developing just uh, in uh, the MRI scan shows only infraspinatus contusion and intact uh, posterior glenoid uh, rim, then it means they may develop in future and intervening at that time for uh, strengthening the scapula muscles and preventing the um, posterior capsular contracture will definitely help uh, in um, uh, preventing uh, posterior labral tear in future. Shyam, may I insert some thoughts also? Please, sir. Please. Every Tuesday morning, I had the pleasure of learning from Dr. Harrison McLaughlin and Charles Neer in our fracture conference. A uh, few people know that Dr. McLaughlin was not an orthopedic surgeon. He was a general surgeon, a trauma surgeon, wrote the classic book called Trauma. May also indicate that one of the first orthopedic surgeons who talked about glenoid version was Professor Saha, who submitted his glenoid osteotomy for retroversion of the glenoid for his PhD thesis. I think it's well worth the time and effort of the fellows to look up Dr. Saha's original contributions. Few people mention his name now, but he was one of the first ones to talk about glenoid version, especially with posterior instability. And I also remember, I did mention a couple of weeks ago about the article about Near and Foster, about capsular shifting. Uh, I think uh, the fellow should look these things up because it'll come of great use in their practice uh, when they go, get out in the open. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you, uh, Gopal. And um, my early visits to US, some visiting surgeons, all that they said, are you, work, are you working with Dr. Saha? Did he work with Saha? And uh, they had a very good impression about him. Thank you. The, the, so I also forgot to mention the role of uh, the osteotomy. So the, right now, what happens is that uh, the uh, McLaughlin procedure has actually masked the need for a rotational osteotomy. But uh, there are some conditions where, uh, in addition to uh, uh, reducing the shoulder, this uh, the Saha's osteotomy actually plays a very important role in chronic logged posterior dislocations, uh, not in uh, these kind of acute or repetitive posterior instability. In a chronic log dislocation, it's a totally different entity where uh, once we release the subscapularis muscle and relocate the shoulder uh, into the glenoid cavity and then medialize the uh, subscapularis tendon, that is, we fix the subscapularis tendon into the reverse uh, heel sac lesion. And if we find that the shoulder is subluxing intraoperatively, then a Sahas uh, 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 derotation osteotomy plays a very, very crucial role. And uh, that is the reason why it's not been done most of the times nowadays, because uh, we don't see many log dislocations. And in these kind of acute uh, posterior instabilities or uh, subluxation, osteotomy is, will be the last resort because all these anatomical procedures hold good. But it is definitely a worthwhile procedure and we must know about it uh, because the, that helps us in uh, uh, keeping the, glia, the uh, humeral head located in the glenoid cavity after doing all the extensive open procedures. Santosh, you can unshare your screen and we can start the next and after the next presentation. Good morning, sir. Um, sir, am I audible, sir? 
Yes, Pravin, you're audible and visible. Yes, sir. Uh, so my topic for today is principles of arthroscopic cuff repair. Um, uh, the arthroscope, the rotator cuff muscles are made up of uh, four interrelated muscles arising from the scapula and attaching onto the tuberosity of the humerus, for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscap. And they fuse together with the articular capsule into a common insertion on the tuberosity of the humerus, which is known as the footprint of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is a dynamic stabilizer of the glenohumeral joint. The centering of the joint by the cuff is achieved by balancing the force couples around the glenohumeral joint. The important functions are counterbalances the upward pull of the deltoid on the humerus, stabilizes uh, stabilizer of the shoulder mainly anterior and posterior cuff, providing fixed fulcrum for concentric rotation of humeral head, external rotation along with abduction and forward elevation of the arm. Uh, the rotator cuff tear can be traumatic or non-traumatic. Traumatic usually occurs in younger age group uh, with high velocity of trauma can cause partial or full thickness tears, whereas repetitive micro trauma in overuse and athlete, uh, whereas uh, non-traumatic uh, is uh, occurs uh, mainly in old age groups due to degenerative work related or subacromial impingement syndrome. Uh, the pathophysiology behind the tear. Once uh, the rotator cuff injury starts with trauma, sometimes can be because of degeneration with insufficient healing seen in repetitive microtrauma. However, a small amount of force is needed to cause a complete tear if there is sufficient tendon degeneration. Once the uh, rotator cuff is torn, it cannot counterbalance the upward pull of the deltoid on the humerus. It um, not able to hold the head of the humerus uh, secure in the glenoid which leads to abutment of the humeral head against the acromion, which causes astabilization, concave deformity of the undersurface of the acromion, which causes narrowing and arthritis of the glenohumeral joint, which finally leads to cuff tear arthropathy with collapse of humeral head. The Hamada classification divides the extra features of the massive rotator cuff tear into five grades. First is acromiohumeral distance, uh, grade one, acromiohumeral distance more than six mm, grade two is less than five mm, uh, stage 3 is stage 2 plus stage 2 plus stabilization of the acromion. Uh, stage 4a is narrowing of the glenohumeral joint space without stabilization. Uh, 4b is with stabilization and uh, stage 5 is stage 4b plus humeral head collapse. There was a study uh, uh, by Stephen Burkhardt that rotator cuff crescent and cable uh, uh, acts as a suspension bridge. The arthroscopy of the shoulder joint shows a consistently identifiable crescent configuration to the portion distal of the uh, to a portion of the distal rotator cuff. This crescent, which we refer to as is rotator crescent, comprises of supraspinatus and infraspinatus insertion contained within the avascular zone, which is perpendicular to the axis of the supraspinatus tendon and arch anteriorly and posteriorly and attach onto the humerus. This thick bundle of fibers resembles the cable of a suspension bridge and when cuff is torn, this acts as a loaded cable of the suspension bridge. The treatment of cuff tears, mainly um, the surgical management is open, mini open and arthroscopic. Uh, the objectives of the uh, uh, surgery is to closure of the defect, eliminating the impingement, preserving the origin of the deltoid muscle and preventing adhesion post-op by proper rehab. The principles of cuff repair are, uh, there are mainly four principles. First is adequate visualization, rotator cuff preparation, appropriate portal placement and suture anchor placement, and secure knot time. First is the intra positions. Uh, first, the lateral decubitus position. Um, another is the beecher position. The main advantage of the lateral decubitus are the uh, traction increases the space in the glenohumeral joint and subacromial space. Uh, and whereas there is no, a decreased risk of cerebral hypoperfusion, in B chair it is an anatomical position, no need of reposition if converting into an open procedure. The disadvantages of the B chair is a risk of cerebral hypoperfusion, whereas in lateral decubitus is risk of neurovascular injury with traction. In um, April 2021, um, Victor et al. Uh, published an article on arthroscopic rotator cuff uh, repair in supine position. To perform uh, in supine position, the arm is fixed on the limb positioner to allow control of traction, forward elevation, abduction, and rotation during the whole surgery. The scope is in 
the scope is introduced in the lateral portal to provide the direct view of the tear and anterior and lateral portal uh, can be used to pass the suture for the anchor positioning and tie the knots uh, a anterior portal uh, which is seen in the red cross can be used uh, as a waiting portal to prevent the entangling of the threads and for a massive rotator cuff tear the surgery is initiated with the posterior lateral portal lateral to the classic soft point uh, soft point incision commonly used the main advantages of this uh, supine position is easy and quick setup no risk of cerebral complication access to all compartment of the shoulder and easy conversion into an open procedure the disadvantages are the need for a traction system uh, uh, need for initial adaptation for the orientation of the scope and risk of bleeding the conclusion despite the uh, initial need for an adaptation time for the uh, operator to orient himself in space the rotator cuff repair in supine position can be easily assessed and performed all compartments can be assessed and there is no risk of catastrophic complication described in beach chair position uh, adequate visualization uh, can be done by uh, uh, techniques to minimize bleeding, adequate subacromial bursectomy or subacromial decompression. This is the most critical step in the cuff repair which establishes and maintains an adequate visual field. Techniques to minimize bleeding. Control of bleeding is a fundamental component. Uh, four factors can be modified to achieve this. Patient's factor that is blood pressure control and use of tranexamic acid. Pump factor, uh, pump pressure and rate of fluid flow. Fluid factors, the use of epinephrine and hello, sir, am I audible? Yes, yes, sir, Praveen, carry yes. on. Yes, sir. Uh, the most important consideration amongst these is elimination of turbulence. Uh, the Bernoulli effect describes a force at right angles to the arthroscopic fluid that sucks the blood from within the capillaries in the subacromial space. By applying digital pressure over the leaking skin portals, bleeding can from the turbulence can be effectively controlled or it can also be achieved with the use of cannula. Uh, the intravenous administration of the tranexamic acid has shown to significantly improve visual clarity and reduce post-operative analgesic consumption. Uh, other measures that may be employed include the addition of an epinephrine to the irrigation fluid and increasing the pump pressure to create a tamponade effect on the bleeding vessels. Subacromial de decompression or bursectomy. The subacromial decompression uh, is to release the tight li uh, ligament of coracacromial arch and to shave away some of the undersurface of the acromion. This raises the roof of the shoulder, allowing more room for the rotator cuff tendons to move to move tendon uh, to move underneath. Subacromial decompression is performed not only to treat subacromial impingement but also to enlarge the surgical field. There is an article in 2018 uh, which was published uh, stating the outcomes after limited or extensive bursectomy during rotator cuff repair which was a randomized control trial. Uh, in this the extensive bursectomy was uh, uh, extensive bursectomy, the subacromial bursa was extensively removed from the anterior to posterior and lateral to medial, whereas a limited bursectomy was minimized to allow uh, tone cuff visualization and tendon repair. In both the groups, 39 uh, pe uh, people were e equally distributed. The avas pain score, passive forward flexion, external rotation at the side, internal rotation at the back was measured at 3, 6, 12 months. Uh, post-op along with the bursal thickening was assessed by USG or MRI. The conclusion of the studies was extensive bursectomy during arthroscopic rotator cuff repair appears to have no benefit in terms of reducing pain and may retard motion by re uh, retard motion recovery by promoting adhesion formation in the subacromial space. In terms of tendon integrity, bursectomy extent did not affect the result. However, marked bursal thickening was more frequently observed in the extensive bursectomy group. As we can see, six months post-op in the extensive bursectomy group, 27 people out of 39 had burs uh, bursal thickening. Uh, preparation of the rotator cuff, uh, cuff tear for repair. Uh, first, uh, we need to identify the rotator cuff tear, mobilize the tear through the soft tissue release, mobilize the tear through marginal convergence sutures. Identifying the cuff tear. Uh, tears of the cuff, rotator cuff are classified according to the mobility of their free margin and shape. The most frequently encountered types are 
crescent shape, U shape, L shape, and massive contracted immobile tires. The cuff repair must satisfy these biomechanical criteria. Force couples must be balanced in coronal and transverse planes. Shoulder suspension bridge must be re established. The residual defect must occupy a minimal surface area. The residual defect must possess edge stability. First is the crescent shaped. Uh, regardless of this test, these tests often exhibit excellent medial to lateral mobility and can be repaired directly to the bone with minimal tension. Whereas in U shape, recognizing this variant is crucial because conventional medial to lateral mobilization as we did in crescent uh, shape test results in tensile overload and potential failure. The technique of marginal convergence is useful under these uh, circumstances. A large in first image, large U-shaped cuff tear extending to the glenoid. And second, a repair of the U-shaped cuff tear begins with side-to-side -side sutures that converge the free margin of the cuff tear towards the bone bed. After placing side-to-side -side, uh, sutures, the free margins of the cuff tear is repaired to the bone with suture anchor. Closing an L-shaped or U-shaped tear is much more like closing like a tent flap. The closure of a U-shaped tear involves first side-to-side -side closure of the vertical limb tear, then tendon to bone closure of the transverse limb tear. Uh, third one is L-shaped tear. L-shaped tear or reverse L-shaped tear may look similar to a U-shaped tear, but uh, one of the free margins is more mobile than the other, allowing it to reduce more easily to the bone. To achieve this, one must determine which leaf is more mobile and where the apex of the L need to be restored. A traction suture into the corner of the tear can facilitate. Side-to-side -side sutures are then placed along the remaining longitudinal split to achieve the marginal convergence. Fixation to the bone can then be accomplished. In this image, is a superior view of an L-shaped tear. The mobility, of the, post, uh, the mobility is posteromedial to anterolateral as we can see in the green arrow. Uh, the traction sutures are uh, at the anterolateral cor anterior corner aids reduction. Uh, in uh, figure B and C, it is a double row technique. The medial row of the sutures is passed to advance the free edge of the tendon to a reduced position aided by the traction suture. Cuff mobilization. Addition may be formed from within the subacromial space between cuff and acromion or cuff and deltoid. The uh, it is important to uh, see the direction of direction of pull and a degree of mobility. Uh, it it is used to correctly reduce the tear. Um, this is best achieved by placing a grasping instrument through the lateral portal when viewing posteriorly, determining the uh, the direction of pull and degree of mobility with which the cuff has maintained. Correct reduction of tear such as an L or Y pattern tear causes a more even distribution of tension and creates a much more anatomic cascade of tissue. Determination of this direction of reduction is a critical initial step before any attempt of stabilization. In, whereas in massive contracted immobile tears have little or no mobility, making marginal convergence and direct tendon to bone repair impossible. In these cases, advanced mobilization technique may be performed to improve mobility of the tissue. Uh, this is an article on uh, arthroscopic uh, repair of massive contracted immobile tears using interval slides. And this the author has uh, 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 shown about the anterior and posterior interval slide. The massive rotator cuff tears are, uh, are immobile in medial to lateral as well as the anterior to posterior direction. In uh, figure, uh, in the adjoining figure, the anterior interval slide is performed. It's an arthroscopic view of a left shoulder from the lateral portal demonstrating the position of the anterior interval slide. The slide is performed along the uh, edge of the supraspinatus tendon, just anterior and medial to the biceps root and directed towards the base of the carotid. Uh, in figure B, an arthroscopic scissor is introduced through the accessory lateral portal and inc uh, incise the tissue separating the supraspinatus from the rotator interval. Uh, the posterior interval slide, uh, arthroscopic view of a left shoulder from the lateral portal demonstrating the position of the posterior interval slide. The posterior interval slide is performed along the posterior interval separating the supraspinatus from the infraspinatus and directed towards the scapular spine. An arthroscopic scissor is introduced through the accessory lateral portal and incise the tissue separating the supraspinatus from infraspinatus. Traction sutures can assist in separating the two tendons from each other and improve visualization of the apex of the interval slide.
थर्ड इज दी एप्रोप्रिएट पोर्टल प्लेसमेंट एंड सूचर एंकर प्लेसमेंट द सू द एनी एंकर शुड बी इंसर्टेड ऑन टू दी बोन एट एन ऑप्टिमल एंगल टू मिनिमाइज टू मैक्सिमाइज इट्स पुल आउट स्ट्रेंथ सूचर एंकल पुल आउट स्ट्रेंथ कैन बी ऑप्टिमाइज बाय इंसर्टिंग दैम एट एन मैकेनिकली फेवरेबल एंगल दिस डेडमेंस एंगल डिस्क्राइब्स both the angle at which the anchor is inserted and the angle that the suture makes with the direction of pull of the rotator cuff the deadman's theory of the suture anchor states that uh, in the adjoining image uh, the uh, deadman is a large rock buried under the ground and attached to the fence post by means of an wire at an angle theta to the ground the t is the tension in the deadman's wire w is the pull of the fence wire and a and ax and ay are the ground reaction forces in the similar way um, this uh, the deadman wire is analogous to the suture the pull of the fence wire on the corner post is analogous to the pull of the rotator cuff and the fence of the post is analogous to the compressed rotator cuff tissue between the suture and the bone in the second image uh the theta 1 is the pull out angle for the anchor that is the angle the suture makes with the perpendicular to the anchor and the theta 2 is the tension reduction angle that is the angle that the suture makes with the direction of the pull of the rotator cuff ideally both should should be less than or equal to 45 degree thus the theta 1 is the pull out angle of the anchor intuitively more acute the uh, theta 1 angle the more difficult it will be it will be to pull out the anchor and uh, for as well as the, uh, for the theta 2 uh, decreases so that the tension in the wire uh, tension in the suture therefore low theta 2 uh, angle is also advantageous by protecting against the suture breakage because it lowers the tension in the suture compared to high theta 2 angle clinically this uh, theoretical uh, finding suggests that suture anchor should be inserted at an angle towards the pre margin of the rotator cuff and that from the anchor the suture should make an acute angle with the direction of pull of the rotator cuff uh, appropriate portal placement uh, the primary portals are posterior portal that is used for viewing portal anterior portal and lateral portal the secondary portals are the five o'clock that is antero inferior seven o'clock posterior inferior nevesia portal a superior posterior to acromio clavicular joint and port of wilmington posterior lateral 1 cm lateral to the posterior lateral acromion there is uh, one um, um, article there is three sister portals for cuff repair for massive rotator cuff tear it describes a three sister portals consisting of the subclavian nevesia and a new posterior infraspinous portal which provides access to all parts of the tendon with minimal rotation of the arm uh, the uh, posterior infraspinous portal is located 1 cm inferior to the spinous process of the scapula at a point along the straight line that connects the subclavian and nevesia a banana lasso that is introduced into this portal at 45 degree to the skin and directed anterolaterally towards the midpoint of the lateral border of the acromion will enter the subacromial space parallel to the cuff as well as perpendicular to the tone edges the advantage of the portal is the scapular spine is readily visible less fluid of less fluid extravasation no rotation of the shoulder required neither a skin incision nor a cannula is required as well as uh, it is safe um, uh, the next is so, uh, secure knot tying during rotator cuff tear the arthroscopist is commonly required to tie an arthroscopic knot in order to obtain secure tissue fixation there is an endless array of knot combination for a knot to be effective it must possess the attributes of both knot security as well as the loop security the knot security is the effectiveness of the knot at resisting slippage when the load is applied and loop security is ability to maintain the tight suture loop as the knot is tight thus uh, in the ad uh, adjoining image uh, uh, thus it is possible for any tied knot to have good knot security but poor loop security as shown in the um, adjoining image uh it is a, uh, a tight suture loop holds the soft tissue tightly opposed to the prepared bone bed in figure a whereas in figure b a loose loop allows the soft tissue to pull away from the prepared bone bed regardless of how securely the knot may be tied some commonly used knots are uh, first is a duncan loop the short video
next is the Nikki's knot. Uh, third is the western knot. And lastly is the Samsung Medical Center knot. Um, a loss of loop security during tying of sliding, sliding knot happens uh, when a sliding knot is tied, locking of the knot is performed by tensioning uh, the wrapping limb and flipping the knot to prevent it from sliding back. In, the, uh, in this A image, a Nikki's knot is, uh, has been tied to a circumferential post and close opposition of this uh, suture to the post is demonstrated. Locking the in the second image, locking the knot by tensioning the wrapping lamp, uh, wrapping limbs, flips the knot and prevents the knot from slipping backward, but also enlarges the suture loop. Uh, note how the suture loop is pulled away from the circumferential post. This effect was seen in almost all the sliding knots, which required a flipping manure to be locked and was related to the locking mechanism of each knot. Thus, this factor must be considered when choosing an arthroscopic knot. The take home message, uh, the principles of cuff repair involves thorough evaluation, precise debridement and tendon mobilization and secure fixation. It's crucial to understand the anatomy, access the tissue quality, perform a meticulous repair. Always consider the individual patient factor and adapt techniques accordingly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, you have discussed about all the salient features of uh, doing, uh, identifying a rotator cuff tear and then how to repair it uh, optimally. So in the coming uh, weeks, we will be discussing in detail about all the individual factors which you have mentioned, like uh, the anchor placement, how many anchors to use, how to reduce a cuff, how to assess a cuff repair, and then what type of knots to be used. Everything will be discussed in detail. So I think we'll be able to grasp as much as possible from this uh, CME. But uh, one thing is, uh, I, I found out that is all the major surgeons in live surgery started using uh, the Duncan knot which has got the least knot security, least loop security. So the reason why it's been used is it's very easy to perform that knot. And that may be uh, controversial because uh, in the hands of young surgeons, uh, the knot may loosen and uh, it may weaken and uh, that may lead to uh, poor rotator cuff feeling or even failure. So try to use uh, uh, sliding knots with uh, very good knot and loop security. Uh, in that case, uh, the the knot which has got a very good um, knot and loop security, the Samsung Medical Center, SMC knot, followed by the Western knot, and then the Nikki's knot. So these three are uh, really good um, uh, uh, sliding knots with uh, no, very good uh, uh, security. Uh, try to avoid the Duncan uh, knot. It may sound easy to look and perform, but it's not got a good security. So uh, we will discuss about uh, all the factors in the coming classes. Uh, and hope I will uh, be able to uh, give more information on each and every topic. Thank you. Should I answer the screen, sir? Yes, I'm going to unshare the screen. We can start with the physio presentation. Yes. Morning, John. Am I audible? Yes, uh, you're audible.
Um, so today my talk is on uh, the shoulder and uh, scapular stability uh, exercises uh, specific. So this is the common protocol that has been recommended for the instability. So that's the uh, Rockwood, Derby and uh, Watson. So the uh, common concept of uh, Rockwood uh, protocol is to work on the rotator cuff and the deltoid, whereas the Derby has uh, two sections. The first section uh, is of uh, the speed of the muscle activation, the plyometric based exercises and deceleration of the movement. So trying to have control there. And the second section is of uh, proprioception, muscle balance and uh, trunk stability uh, focus. In the Watson, uh, it is mainly on retraining and maintaining a good uh, humeral head control uh, and in that, in the stage one and two, uh, the focus is uh, to have the glenohumeral being uh, controlled uh, uh, during the translations, the arc of movement and the development of uh, posterior uh, muscles. And uh, the focus in the later stages is to progress to strengthening and uh, sports specific drills. So this is a study in Australia where they did uh, the comparison of uh, both the groups. So the, the pointer to note here is in uh, how the group fo focuses on the exercises. So the, the exercises are more focused on the internal external rotation, that is the glenohumeral, and the recommendation of using the resistance band and the load progression using the weights. Whereas the Watson uh, uh, group is... Uh, focused on the scapular uh, control, which is to be builded and uh, going with uh, initially with limited range of motion of the cuff where uh, internal external rotation or to up to 45 degree and then progression uh, going up to uh, 90 degree. And this is the various uh, uh, outcome measures they used uh, in this particular study. So the uh, uh, concept of uh, the stabilization is to uh, see that uh, the scapula stabilization and the humeral uh, head uh, stabilization exercise has to be both uh, incorporated. And uh, in the Watson and Derby and Rockwood, these were the differences what we saw. So the Watson program uh, provides uh, the therapist with set principles to guide the treatment. As mentioned earlier, the uh, scapular uh, recruitment pattern and then the cup strength. And uh, the scapular correction uh, can be done uh, as an objective test by the therapist where we support the scapula like the scapular assisted test uh, so you you support it at the axilla and make them do uh, the range of motion or strength testing. And if you find the difference, you will know that uh, the scapula correction has to be uh, more focused. And in the humeral head correction, you need to uh, do a posterior translation of the glenohumeral uh, head and then see how the range of motion or the strength is improving. So these are some of the exercises, dosages, what they are recommending and the repetition, how it has to be done. Uh, this is the scapula setting exercises where retraction is done, recommended. This is using a resistance band, uh, which is uh, tied around the uh, glenohumeral scapula region. This is uh, the external rotation strengthening along with the retraction of the scapula. Uh, what we also do is uh, in the initial phase, we use the surface EMG or the uh, electrical stimulation for patients. Sometimes we are uh, using this for patients uh, who's having a very poor uh, scapular uh, uh, recruitment. I hope this uh, video is visible. This is of a scapular dyskinesis patient. Uh, 
this kind of a patient whose uh, recruitment of the lower trapezius and the rhomboids was uh, not at all happening. So we put him on the surface EMG, which was giving him uh, the information of how the muscles are at what level it has to recruit. And then give him uh, the lower trapezius activation. So I'm using the sliding board so that uh, it's easier for him to control the movements. So the uh, Principles are activating, stretch, strengthening, posture, and functional pattern. So initially, once the pain management is done, then the uh, activation and movements are restored, followed by strength and proper suction and control. So the basic principles of uh, stability exercise is to understand that uh, the, the more stable, only then the mobility can be done. And to assess stability also, we need to put the movement in the glenohumeral to understand if they are uh, stable. So the exercise uh, principles or the plan will be to have muscle recruitment first, then uh, achieve pain-free range of motion. And uh, once we have some amount of range of motion achieving, we will simultaneously start strengthening functional recruitment and activity specific. So the exercises can be isometric, it can be multi-angle in, in different position. And uh, sometimes we use the position against the gravity, sometimes gravity assisted. And uh, the goal will be to always have a, a progression uh, which is gradually going on. Um, upper body, mostly we will prefer open kinematic uh, exercises. The closed kinematic will be for uh, the stability or the proper reception and bands and weights are used. Uh, recruitment of the muscle is uh, uh, required mandatory at different uh, range of motion. And uh, activity specific, uh, we have to see that the recruitment happens post exercises. So the stabilization protocol can be uh, as per recommendation from the Derby and the uh, Rockwood uh, is uh, to have initially some amount of stretching then activation and strengthening, which is in the pain-free range. And in the second week, uh, we progress still with uh, the stretch and activation and strengthening. And then by one month later, we start strengthening progression and into functional training. So sixth week, we should be able to progress to free weights machine workouts. So what are the things to look out when we are doing exercise, uh, exercises? Uh, look for the uh, muscle shortness in the pectorals, upper trapezius, scapular tightness, and look for activation uh, of the deltoid, which could be uh, decreased. And then sometimes you can have the pain or low irritability because of the trigger points on the trapezius, deltoid, serratus, pecs, and decreased uh, joint lines. So just a quick uh, note on the anatomy, the serratus anterior, which is uh, commonly uh, um, inhibited in our uh, patients of shoulder and how they correlate with the upper trapezius and lower trapezius. So because of uh, the non-functioning uh, or the recruitment of the serratus anterior and lower trapezius, the upper trapezius over functions. And ideally, this uh, three fibers of the trapezius should be positioning the scapula in the appropriate position. And this becomes functional when they are uh, linked with the obliques uh, into a functional pattern. So the basic principle uh, of uh, the movement is uh, if one plane is moving, the other two planes are uh, providing stability uh, during the dynamic action. And uh, this is how uh, Janda proposes uh, the muscle group uh, division into movement group and stabilization group. And uh, you can see that uh, the stabilization group uh, commonly has the middle, lower trapezius, serratus, rhomboids. And the characteristics that uh, is that the stabilization uh, group always been prone to weakness and inhibition. 
and they tend to get like less activated in the functional movement pattern and they fatigue easily whereas the movement group uh, becomes more tight so that's your upper trapezius and levator uh, scapula so these are some of the papers which suggest that uh, how a rotator cuff uh, repair uh, uh, the scapular uh, substitution uh, happens and it uh, improves only by one year time so the uh, protraction and uh, cuff strength correlation is that whenever there is an excessive scapular protraction that decreases the uh, activation of the cuff by about 23 percentage and uh, excessive protraction or retraction demonstrate decreased uh, strength. So these are some of the taping methods which can be used for patients to help uh, give a proprioception and uh, uh, corrective uh, method for the scapula. This is using the rigid tape, oh, sorry, the kinesio tape. And uh, this is the scapular stability exercises. So the idea is the weight with open catabite. So the patient is needed to uh, have a control of the movement. So this is in close catabite. So trying to move up, how you do for the core. But the focus here is on the shoulder. So try to stabilize the shoulder, keep it as still as possible. So you challenge by mobility of the limb. This is preparation, challenging the mobility, uh, stability. So the therapist will move the arm uh, by pushing it. Uh, so he is introducing the mobility component in different angle, different direction. And uh, the focus will be to see that the glenohumeral and scapular stability and is now challenging it with the Swiss ball where the trunk is also put on an unstable surface. So coming on to the YTML, so this is the, the common documented exercises. So ideally YTML is the scapular base exercise. And we know that in practicality, the uh, sometimes the exercise is very difficult for the patient to do. They make a lot of mistakes uh, while doing this exercise. So the focus should be on specific exercises. So this is a patient who is, uh, again, in the scapular dyskinesia, trying to retrain him. So this patient stayed two, three days only to get the retraining. So I'm trying to focus here on the scapular. Now this is stabilized. And then you are challenging it with the glenohumeral uh, mobility. This weight is added there for proprioception because he was not aware of how much he is moving or whether he is able to hold it. So now with the weight, he is able to feel and appreciate the uh, amount of movement and stability he is able to do. So now I'm progressing them. So this is just to, the sliding board is just to take the friction off. Now I'm challenging him with multi-directional of movement and still having the scapula stabilized and holding there. I progress now with weights and the focus here is to see whether he can hold the scapula better and not looking at the full range. And this is for low trapezius, whether he can sustain it, yes, and then only limited movement. So this is again the same, this was for an elbow patient and he had poor uh, strength of the scapular and control. So this is using a Swiss ball. So this gives me a better uh, visualization of the scapula and how I can see them. And again, controlling them with various direction of movements. So challenging different pattern of movements and still focusing that the stability is better. So with the uh, resistance band, this is uh, trying to get the scapular activation in multi-direction. So from uh, open kinematic, adding resistance and seeing that he is able to 
do the exercise. This is the lower trapezius activation. So using a resistance band and the movement has to be diagonal so that it is in line with the scapula going into a depression. So that's the primary function of the lower trapezius. So we start in supine line because the scapula gets stabilized and the patient is aware, uh, appreciable of the movement and then progress to standing against the wall. So this is similar to the YTML, but you can't do the direct YTML. and then progressing to the cuff strengthening exercises. So the key points here is, this is an isometric cuff strengthening where I am holding the position of internal rotation and the patient is moving. So that will encourage the movement. So this is something commonly used for massive cuff patients where they have severe pain and we are asked to uh, have rehab. So we, we don't do that. This is different position I'm keeping neutral and doing and then progress to the internal rotation using the bands. And the towel is added here to see uh, that the position of the glenohumeral is appropriate to have better uh, activation of the muscle. Sometimes a uh, bulkier patient or who has mass fat on the axilla region might not need the towel because the position changes. So we, that is assessed and done. The same uh, exercise is also done on the ISO shift, which gives them uh, a feedback. So we use the cable and adjust the resistance. So the take-home message is selection of position is key. Uh, we need to find out which is the better position for them to have the scapular activation done. It could be supine, prone, or standing. Then the stability exercise involves mobility. So we tell the patient that we are not looking at full range of movement, that they have better control of the scapula while doing the glenohumeral movement. Then the scapular exercise to focus on scapular activation in various range of motion. So we, we try and give them challenging movements and still see that the scapula is uh, activated or stabilized. Uh, Glenohumeral stability can be started in supine lying and then progress to standing. Graded resistance by band of uh, weights and uh, the scapula mobility challenges uh, is in activating the muscle and sustaining that stability in the early phases of uh, rehab. Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, uh, Ganesan. What we follow here is actually a combination of uh, the um, Watson and Rockwood program, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. It's not just a pure Watson. Yeah, no, sir. Because they 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 do, they do the scapula at the very late stage. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, see, uh, two things which I want to add here is now with the uh, presence of all these devices which we have here in our uh, physio department. Uh, we need to come up with uh, some uh, sort of uh, research publications. And uh, what presentation that you did here was actually good enough. And we have a lot of ideas. We can assess, we have the handheld dynamometer. We can assess the muscle recruitment pattern or the muscle, how, how early the muscle regains its preoperative strength uh, with uh, the dynamometer. And we can compare it in patients with and without instability. And so we can come up with, uh, we are already doing a study uh, as far as proprioception is concerned. Proprioception uh, includes even the neurological as well as muscular balance. Now, if you can have the handheld dynamometer and do a study on how early the proprioception and the muscle pattern recovers, we can come up with some nice uh, you know, um, cohort of uh, patients and we can uh, publish it in the JOSPT also. So kindly come up with uh, uh, new ideas. Uh, uh, about uh, all these rehab patterns and uh, try make sure that all the physiotherapists are involved in uh, research and publication. Second thing is, you've got a fantastic collection of videos. Now, it is of no use unless and until it just stays here. Now, we have to make sure that it should be visible to people who want to learn about it. And I request you to make something like uh, the shoulder rehab 
protocol the cuff rehab protocol or cuff rehab program and put all the videos sequentially in the orthone academy so that it will be accessible for the members and then we can try to improvise on the programs also okay sir hello ma do we have any questions if no sir can we end the meeting sir yeah uh, please uh, thank you thank you sir thank you. Sir. thank you sir thank you thank you uh, gopal are you there yes i am all right thank you uh, good night i am right good night enjoyed the meeting good can you do that Gracias.